And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence. It was 1776 when the founders signed the writ of independence from the Brit. It was revolution. Welcome to the Republic for the United States of America. You may call me Kelby. I am an American. Today is April 28th of 2016. Tonight's RNN featured show, Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel, is going to be exciting. The RNN, which stands for the Republic News Network, has been doing these calls for over six years, and this has always been a friendly introduction for the people of the United States Corporation. It is true, the United States is a federal corporation, and their exclusive jurisdiction lies within the District of Columbia, and you can find this information under Title 28, Section 3002, and UCC 9-307H. The Republic government was just a bunch of U.S. citizens that realized they wanted to be Americans, as our founders intended. We've been hard at work now for eight years and have successfully re-inhabited the original government vacated under Lincoln in 1861. I know, it's hard to understand, don't worry. We are law-abiding, peaceful Americans and very pro-government. You can consider the Republic members are tired of all the corruption. See, we found in the law that there is, in fact, two forms of government here on our land. And we did something about it. We're people. Mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, we have families just like you. We simply found some truths. And we're, we're now sharing these important truths with the rest of the world. So get ready to hear things that sound amazing. And get ready to understand that you too can be history. Again, we welcome each one of you to the Republic for the United States of America. Please bow your heads with us in prayer. Father God, we want to thank you for this opportunity to share information that really nobody's ever heard of. We want to thank you for Mr. Happel and his guests that are coming on the show to talk about things that are difficult to comprehend. But Lord, just bless the ears. Let them hear, let them understand, and let them, Lord, be raised up to be a part of a solution. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dan Happel, I yield. Thank you, Calby. We've got a very exciting show tonight. I've got two of the absolute uh, leading experts in the world on Agenda 21, and they will be talking to us tonight about the uh, issue of uh, the different COGS and the uh, councils of government which are taking over our country now and explain that whole process. Before we start with that, let me just tell you very briefly what Agenda 21 is for the listeners that have not been uh, to our earlier programs. Agenda 21 is the name of the white paper written after the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. <clears throat> that Earth Summit uh, was billed as a conference on the global environmental issues facing mankind and a blueprint for the 21st century. In reality, it was a blueprint for the future of mankind where our Constitution, national sovereignty, and unalienable rights are eliminated and replaced by a Marxist world government controlled by a powerful elite of international financial oligarchs. Under Agenda 21, many of man's activities are listed as unsustainable and targeted for elimination by the year 2030. Number one, all private property ownership and rights are targeted for elimination. All forms of crop irrigation, pesticides, and commercial fertilizers, except when they're approved for big agribusiness, uh, like Monsanto, ADM, and other companies that are approved for agricultural production by the government. Number three, livestock production and most meat consumption will be eliminated, will be living in a vegetarian world. Privately owned vehicles and personal travel will be eliminated. Burning of fossil fuels for energy production will be eliminated. Uh, Single-family homes and 
uh, individual residences will be eliminated, will be living in stack and pack housing. Most forms of mineral extraction and timber harvesting will be eliminated and tightly controlled by a UN world government. And uh, dams, ski lodges, um, different resort communities will be eliminated. And the final thing that's probably the most important, the human population will be reduced to fewer than a billion people uh, to be a sustainable world. <clears throat> so with that said, uh, I would like to introduce my guest for the, tonight's program. Uh, Michael Shaw is an attorney and a CPA from uh, Southern California. He's been one of the leaders of the uh, battle against Agenda 21 in uh, Southern California. He has worked uh, tirelessly to try to uh, slow down and reverse the One Bay Area plan for uh, the San Francisco Bay Area under a COG, which is a Council of Government. Um, and then um, Michael Kaufman, who was one of the very leaders of this whole program. Uh, Michael appeared before the U.S. Senate in 1994 and with Kay Bailey Hutchison presented the Wildlands map to the U.S. Senate and through their efforts, they got the uh, Wildlands Project and the Sustainability Treaty stopped dead in its tracks uh, at a vote of 98 to 2. Since then, our government, including our presidents, uh, and I say virtually every one of our presidents, has been on board with the idea of implementing sustainable development goals through cabinet level agencies and through administrative decisions uh, for the last 20 years. And as a result, we have now many of the programs that even though they weren't approved by the Senate, they weren't approved as a treaty, we now have many of those things in place. And so with that said, I would like to uh, introduce my guests, and I guess uh, um, I will refer to Mike Kaufman and Michael Shaw. That way we know which one I'm speaking to. <clears throat> but, Mike, I would like to have you kind of talk about your early efforts uh, against Agenda 21 and a little bit more about your background. Well, let me just explain a little bit where I'm coming from and how I got into this, and I think it will be helpful for the listening audience uh, I was leading a multi-million dollar research effort for the paper industry back in the 1990s on acid rain and global climate change. I have a Ph.D. in that area. And I kept coming across this stuff about sustainable, sustainability and uh, even heard the words Agenda 21, although they didn't mean anything to me at that time. And I got very suspicious and, and really just did a segue and started to study what was going on and went into a state of shock as I realized this was a effort to create a world government where you and I are nothing but serfs in a plantation with overlords over us. And I came to know this as Agenda 21, as Michael Shaw will be able to explain as well. And it was basically created through, well, it goes back in the 1970s. I'm not going to go back that far, but let's just go back in the 1990s. There's an organization called the IUCN, the International Org Union for Conservation of Nature. And this is a United Nations organization, or affiliated organization, in which you have both environmental organizations and uh, federal agencies of different nations meeting behind closed doors to discuss how they can implement this concept of sustainability on the world. And it's, be again, behind closed doors. Understand that. It's, it's done in secret. And the thing is that the process of this was that they were able to create a situation where to the average American, all this concept about sustainable development and so forth, sounded wonderful and it sounded like we need to do this by all means. It was coming from all directions in our society, both from the federal government, from environmental organizations, 
and from others that were planted in various locations. And everybody accepted it. It sounded wonderful. It really did. I mean, if you just listen to what they're saying, it sounds wonderful. However, it was designed basically to fool us, to trick us, as it were, into accepting this so that they could re- put the leash around our necks and, and put the chokehold on every American citizen. And it, it worked. It worked very well. And now we have, as as Dan said, we have agencies and so forth that are working independently with no congressional oversight uh, to implement this agenda, and it really is a very dangerous thing. We have accepted here in the United States under something called a Sustainable America, and it's divided into seven different units uh, of different activities around the country. And we're going to be talking about some of those here tonight as to how they're being implemented with nobody really understanding how. Good, Mike. Thank you for that. And uh, with that said, I will, uh, I'd like to turn over the uh, microphone to uh, Michael Shaw. And maybe, Michael, if you would uh, talk about the programs that you've been involved in and some of the things you've done in the uh, Santa Cruz area and talk about the ABAG and the COGS that are going on in uh, Central California. Well, I, I would start by saying that I would briefly summarize Agenda 21 as the action plan for world government. In other words, this is the plan to be adopted by all nations and all uh, operations of government around the world, not just here, but around the world, to create a condition wherein uh, we're left with um, everywhere becoming an outpost of a world government. And uh, we see those steps being rapidly taken. Um, Australia, for instance, is much advanced of even California in terms of implementing the Agenda 21 program and creating uh, an outpost for um, world government there in the, in the state of Queensland. But California isn't far behind. And um, um, you know, as you mentioned, I live in Santa Cruz, which is not in Southern California. It's really in Central California, right below, um, oh, just just west of uh, Santa Clara County and the Bay Area counties, or down on the southern side of that. And uh, is, Santa Cruz was sort of the one of the five or six places around the country <clears throat> where Agenda 21 was seated early, back in the early 90s. We were on pace with our political. Um, uh, our operatives being very focused on implementing the programs of Agenda 21. Now, what happened was that uh, a lot of action um, undertaken uh, locally um, stalled them, stalled them through much of the year 2000. But today they're kind of back on track. But what, what has happened is that the counties north of us, the Bay Area counties, nine Bay Area counties, have taken really a national lead in the implementation of Agenda 21. So what what we see is um, an area, a land mass of 7.5 million people that are politically firmly committed to these ideas that that lead to um, global governance and really really, um, portend for the um, end days of the American Republic. And hey, Michael, while, uh, with that, can you uh, can you kind of uh, lead into the role of NGOs and uh, the UN sanctioned bodies that have brought on the uh, programs of Agenda 21 in well in the whole world, but especially uh, in the United States. Well, yes, the, the, there are in, NGOs or so-called non-governmental organizations are in general groups that have been uh, sanctioned by the United Nations with that nomenclature for purposes of taking their position in in helping to implement Agenda 21 here and everywhere. So you'll find that most of your environmental groups, um, the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund are NGOs, meaning they're accredited by the UN for purposes of implementing and advancing Agenda 21, wherever it is they operate. So 
but, but NGOs are, are very widespread. There's about 10,000 NGOs operating in the United States today, and they include, include um, business activities. The Chamber of Commerce is an NGO. So whether you're talking about left-wing environmental groups or right-wing business, so-called right-wing business groups, you'll find that um, when, when you see the NGO designation attached to it, that their purpose is for the implementation of Agenda 21. So what we find across the country is that there are all kinds of sources that are working to advance this globalist cause. And if we stopped and looked at the political parties, both of them are got their hands all over this stuff. Whether you're President Bush or President Obama or President Clinton, it's what drives your administration. And so we're a long ways down this road. And you say, well, if that was the case, I'd have heard about it. And my response to that is, where would you have heard it from? The newspapers? The newspapers aren't run by by journalists anymore. The Bay Area has six or eight newspapers, all of which are owned by a hedge fund in Chicago. And they will not talk anything about Agenda 21 or COGS, which we're going to talk about, which is the mechanism for transforming local governments. Word of that never hits a newspaper. So the public is uninformed. In the Bay Area, very few people understand Agenda 21. Very few people have ever heard of a COG. In the Bay Area, the COG is called ABAG, the Association of Bay Area Governments. And today, in 2016, if we look at this globalist assault on the United States and on every other country, you have to recognize that they've moved very far down the path in the last 25 years. And if we don't catch on quick and terminate some of these globalist policies that have totally swallowed up our country's politic, and particularly withdraw our city compliance with the COG dictates, if we don't do something soon about these issues, it will become too late. Now, I may be jumping ahead of myself because I haven't explained what a COG is and how it operates. And uh, Well, Michael, can, um, let, let's get into that globalism because we will get into the COG thing, and I do want you to give a thorough explanation of that. But <clears throat> almost everybody in this country is being inundated on a on a daily, if not hourly, minute-by-minute minute basis on the importance of globalization. Well, that term, globalization, is nothing other than implementation of UN Agenda 21. Am I correct about that? Well, I think I look at Agenda 21 as the action plan to get us to globalization. When we get to globalization, I think you can describe that in a lot of different ways. I know Pat Wood on a show of yours recently described that as technocracy, which makes, which fits into the picture very neatly. Um, other people call it communism, or other people call it fascist communism. But Agenda 21 is the action plan to cement the power in the hands of the globalist leaders so that the world population can be culled, and so that individual um, attitudes can be directed and um, so that people become, you know, cogs in a government shtick. And uh, we don't get there without Agenda 21, but Agenda 21 is not the end course. Right, right. Now, uh, Mike, would you – I know we had a little discussion about this on – uh, the uh, radio on uh, Montana uh, Montana Today, and that was uh, talking about the importance of recognizing what public-private partnerships are, <clears throat> excuse me, and the role of uh, the foundation money 
that is going into all of the uh, environmental groups, and these are tax-exempt foundations. So in other words, the American taxpayers are paying for our own rope because the tax-exempt groups are the ones that are funding all of this. Yes, they are. In fact, the the uh, Grant Makers Association of America basically funds almost five hundred million to seven hundred and fifty million dollars a year in activism. Now they don't give out usually these huge grants. They give out you know ten thousand, twenty thousand, fifty thousand dollars to a small organization who are highly motivated to start to agitate. And the fact is that. It's all been directed. It's, you think the environmental movement is, is a group of these people who are really fighting for the environment, and most of those that are on the ground probably are. However, they're being directed, they're being funded by organizations like the Grant Makers Association, which is made up of many different uh, powerful foundations that j- direct what they fund and therefore direct what actually happens. And it's been very effective, as Michael said, uh, they thought this thing through from every direction, and it's been, as we've looked at it over the last 25, 30 years, uh, they have been marching right along, and it's really at this point right now where uh, it's, as Michael said, it's imminent. If we don't change it fast, we're going to get entrenched. And I want to m- mention one or two things about uh, this whole thing with the COG system. The COG system is set up in a way that you have representatives from various local governments set up. That's usually the way. I'm sure there are exceptions. But the fact is that there is no accountability to the local population, almost none. And as a consequence, they can do pretty much whatever they want to, and you have no voice in it whatsoever as as a private citizen. And that's a very, very important thing that people don't fully understand. They they look at all this wow stuff that's being presented. You know, I'm, I'm looking at a program that we helped stop in Florida where it says that um, it's, it will leverage resources, drive competitiveness and prosperity, greater opportunities, sustained job creation, open space, transportation options, environmental. Who would be against that? Who would possibly be against that? That's their, their advertising. And yet, that's just a smokescreen. And what we're seeing here is basically an effort to trick people, as I said before, trick people into thinking that this is wonderful when, in fact, they're taking your basic rights away systematically, one by one by one. And the most important of those is private property rights. You can't survive without private property rights. You cannot create wealth without private property rights. It's been demonstrated time and time again. And as a consequence, what they're doing is basically telling people what they can and cannot do with their private land and they know the individual no longer has the ability to determine his own or her own destiny on that piece of property. Well, Mike, and uh, with that said, I'm going to I'm going to uh, include a quote here. Uh, this is from the policy statement by the United Nations Conference on Human Settlements, that was known as Habitat yes. One, in Vancouver, B.C., in 1976, and this is. Uh, listed as agenda item number 10. Land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth and therefore contributes to social injustice. If unchecked, it may become a major obstacle in the planning and implementation of development schemes. Okay, back to you. Well, I think it's very key to understand what they're saying right there. One is that they basically plan to plan all your whole life, everybody's life. Now, that can't be done on an individual basis, but on a massive basis, it basically defines what you can and cannot do. It's the local governments that enforce it. And one of the problems that we face with that is that by doing so, you're denied the right to be able to decide how to use your best la- your land that's best for your family, whether it's growing crops, building an uh, uh, auto shop, whatever the case might be. 
The fact is you're being told you can either do it or you cannot do it. And if you can do it, you're subject to tremendous limitations. I don't know if you're seeing that in the San Francisco Bay Area yet, Michael, but it's going to come if it's not already. And it's really a, a, a stunning thing when people all of a sudden wake up and realize that uh, they don't have any control over their own destiny anymore. And this is happening not only in the Bay Area. It's happening all across this country, in small communities, large communities, doesn't matter what. You get a bunch of brain-dead uh, bureaucrats and, and uh, elected officials in position that just think this is great stuff, probably because it gives them more power. And they take it and basically start to run over their own citizens. And that, I've seen that happen time and time again. So it is really important to understand that. And the other thing is, is basically, is that private property rights is what gives a nation its wealth. I mean, again, that's been demonstrated time and time again. And yet they're basically saying that it's wealth accumulation that causes all this social injustice and so forth. This is the United Nations saying this, that is causing all this social injustice and so forth. And it's not true. Now, there are cases where you have a dictator or something of that nature where that could be true. But in a representative government where the people are in control of the government, that will never happen. It won't happen because the people won't let it happen. Well, uh, Michael, with that segue, I think this is a perfect time for you to talk about how you got involved <clears throat> in this process and how your property in Santa Cruz, you've got, uh, what, 80 acres right on the ocean, a uh, beautiful piece of property, and how that uh, zoning on that property impacted you and how that really drew you into investigating more about the Agenda 21 program. Well, I, I bought a, a piece of property, um, well, well placed. It's not right on the ocean, but it's it's very close. And uh, uh, an interesting piece, interesting topography. Bought it in 1986. It was zoned for lots of things, and, um, you know, I sought to do some things. And after 30 years, I can tell you that uh, despite uh, uh, endless efforts, um, I've received no permit from the planning department for anything. And that's because, you know, the county just says, we don't want you to use that property. And that's that. That's a reflection of the new world order, and, and I think draws right out of the the, the quote uh, that that you read uh, from the United Nations about um, go government's intention. If the government supports the UN, and ours certainly does, uh, government's intention in in regards to what they how they want to deal with property. I think it's clear. I, I remember my seventh grade teacher said. Life in the early 21st century is going to be difficult because of globalist movements. And she said, where we'll focus is on the California coast. Mm -hmm. And she said, um, and as the California coast goes, so will the country. Well, I grew up and bought a piece along the California coast because I wanted to, to fight that battle. And I, I can tell you that uh, the fight for private property interests along the California coast is dead. It's lost, at least for the time being. And uh, what I've done with my property over 30 years, I've worked to, I, I've worked the, <laughs> the green path. I have um, undertaken a, a weeding um, regime over the last 30 years with as many as 16 men a, a day working six days a week to put this in a natural condition with native plants, drawing upon native seed banks and causing those to crop up out of the ground. And today it's probably the most beautiful property I've ever seen. But even if you do what they say, they are there to, to, to make sure it happens. Let's say you do it. That gets you no points. Their goal is control. Yes. Can I interrupt just for a second, Michael, here? I think it's imperative for the listening audience to understand the goal is not to help the environment. The environment is just a surrogate issue to justify what they're doing. Their goal is to control. That's their whole goal. And if they, and it's true, especially true with global warming, and we're, we're not going to get into that tonight, but nonetheless, the fact is that the environment they could care less about. 
it's a control over you and I, and they're using the environment as the leverage in, or, in order to do that. I'm sorry for interrupting, Michael. Well, no, thank you, because that's 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 exactly the point I'm trying to make, and you just said it very efficiently. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Michael, would you talk about uh, your experience with ABAG, with the, about the lawsuit, and some of the things that have been going on with your fight against the uh, area, uh, Bay Area uh, master plan, and talk about how the communities within the Bay Area are being literally uh, absorbed by this cog, this council of government that is eliminating all elected local governments. Okay, well... Let's start at the beginning. What is a COG and where did it come from? A COG is a council of government. Most people have never heard of such a thing. Councils of government have been around for a long time. It was Dwight Eisenhower who created the councils of government, and he did it so that he could get around the constitutional limitations on federal um, powers and build the, the uh, infra intrastate freeway system. So seemingly, in the minds of most people, well, that was a good thing. We got a freeway system. But what we did in getting that freeway system is we changed our form of government. Now you jump forward, and COGS, COGS would come into states one by one through federal agencies. They would come into each state when the state said, okay, we want to set up a COG system. And it was in the 1970s that California set up its COG system. It was Ronald Reagan who brought them to California. Today, every state has a COG system, and it covers oh, 99, easily 99% of the land mass in America. So what a COG system is, is it takes a region. The Bay Area is a region. So their COG is called the Association of Bay Area Governments, or ABAG. So this COG set up in the 70s began scheming for its exercise of power. Nobody knew really it existed. Nobody monitored it. And what the COG was created from were picked elected officials. So in ABAG, they've got 100 cities. They would pick people on each, uh, from various city councils to serve on ABAG if they believed in the global, globalist objectives of the COG system. So we have the worst of the worst politicians getting together regularly and planning out the creation of a regional government. Now, what has happened here in the last few years is that they've hit their real gliding stride. And what ABAG has done is it has announced a program called One Bay Area. Nine counties, 100 cities, 7.5 million people. And it's going to be centrally run by this COG that nobody knows about, nobody elected. They certainly didn't elect these people as COG members. They elected them as city council members, but they're acting as COG members with this power that's just grabbed out of air. There's no basis for the power, either from the federal government's formation of it or from the local implementation of the program. Now, it's important to know everywhere has got a COG, and all the COGs are going to ultimately do the same thing. So it's important to see what goes on in the corners of the United States, down down in southern Florida, or up here in the Bay Area in California, because those two programs look quite identical. The difference being that in the Bay Area, it's going down without a hitch. We don't have the kind of small counties that stood up against the southern Florida um, assault. Uh, these counties are all urbanized counties. And uh, it's the center of Silicon Valley, and it just slid right through. There are very few politicians who are noting or objecting to the situation. That's They're absolutely astounding. 
that's absolutely astounding that that's happened that easily and and that our government elected officials are not standing up for the people uh mike would uh, this is a good point where we uh, need to stop for a break uh kelby would you like to take the break and then when we get back mike i'd like to have you talk about the uh florida 750 plan yep okay thank you kelby Thank you, sir. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we appreciate you coming on these calls uh, every week, week in and week out. Um, I'd like to point you to republicforthunitedstates.org. Again, republic, excuse me, for the United States. Um, a lot of people confuse. We do have both republic of and republic for the United States.org. Um, right there on our home page is a uh, today is the day. Claim your inheritance. Click and suffix. Uh, affix your mark or your signature to the Declaration of Sovereign Intent. We encourage you. It's a 150 some odd page document that we've spent the last six years uh, putting together and drafting. And you will actually read how we reseeded uh, this Republic nation and what we had to, in fact, do to uh, get to that point. Um, you know, peruse our website. Uh, check it out. We've got six years worth of phone calls, radio shows, and, and different things. We have calls throughout the week uh, every single day, um, and we encourage you to participate, especially on our, our Wednesday call, uh, which is uh, the building the state's phone call, where we actually give practical application on how you can lawfully re-inhabit uh, county by county, state by state. Uh, so we do look forward to uh, seeing you guys every week, week in and week out. Um, please bring a friend to every Thursday uh, radio show or phone call um, to encourage them to understand there is a solution that is there. And it is, in fact, the original Republic vacated and then now re-inhabited in 2010. Mr. Happel, thank you. Thank you, Kelby. Um, okay, Mike, uh, Florida 750, would you like to talk about that? Well, Florida 750 is apparently organized. I'm not as familiar as with the One Bay Area as Michael is, but I've, as far as I can tell, everything about the 750 program overlaps that of the One Bay Area. In other words, the One Bay Area is a kind of the template. The 750 program basically is uh, a offshoot of that that is trying to take southeast of Florida, the seven counties in southeast Florida, and turn them into a regional government, much like Michael described earlier in the program. And what we're seeing is that it was very effective at, you know, wowing the local people and so forth. But the one difference that Michael mentioned, and I think it's a very key difference, and I don't know how to overcome it, is that the northern counties, the northern four counties of, of, of the east coast of Florida, of south of Florida, are agrarian, still agrarian. They still just have a lot of agriculture and, and so forth. And there's one thing that I have noticed is that people that live off the land and live on the land – basically have a much better appreciation of what reality is than those who live in big cities and so forth. Uh, and I'm not downplaying you if you live in a big city and so forth. I'm just saying that because they come up with the forces of, against the forces of nature, they have to overcome it and use it in a way that profits both them and, the, and nature itself. But anyway, they tumbled onto the fact, in fact, one of the counties – had a, a commissioner that basically really tumbled on to what was happening very fast. And he basically really wrote hard on, on the whole process, wrote a 10-page letter explaining exactly what was going on. They have these public meetings and so forth, scoping meetings, in which the, it's basically organized right from the start. The conclusions are foregone. Uh, and they steer and they have people at each table to make sure that the same result comes from each table. And eventually it comes to the point where uh, they have the whole thing is designed basically to take your private property rights away. Really, it's, it's, he was astonished uh, when he wrote this letter at the fact that it was so blatant and yet nobody saw it. Nobody saw it because it was all covered up with these platitudes like, you know, prosperity and and uh, leverage resource and comprehensive and pros uh, greater opportunities, sustainable job creation, open space. If you go through your local documents where they're trying to do the same thing, you'll see the same exact words. 
same exact words as a template from one to the other. And I think Michael is right. The one Bay Area probably is the, the master template for everything because it's really designed to lock up a, an area. Now, one Bay Area thing was, what, passed two years ago, Michael, a year and a half ago? Uh, yeah, it's been a few years now. Yeah, and they haven't come down and basically told everybody what they have to do and what they can't do and all the rest of it yet, but it's happening. It's happening as a process. And eventually, in 20 years or so, all of a sudden people will wake up and say, wait a minute, what's going on here? I don't have any control over my own life anymore. And that's what's happening in the 750 plan in southeast Florida. And once people become energized, I was down twice helping going to different cities in different counties, explaining what was going on. And they organized. It wasn't me. It was them. I mean, it was their effort. Uh, and they organized and basically fought back this monolith that was being created out of Dade County, which is Miami, uh, in a way that really, really just took the four count northern counties out of the whole process entirely. And they're still trying. I mean, they're still trying to bring those four counties back in. I don't think they're, it's going to work because now the people are aware of it. And this is one of the things that I want to encourage you with. I've got several other examples, but we don't have time to get into them, of how citizens can stand up and basically block this. Now, if you're in a tremendous urban area like the Bay Area, uh, I don't know. I mean, their political clout is just beyond belief. And Dade County tried to do that. One of the things that really convinced a lot of people is that the head of this whole organization – uh, did a video, it was videotaped once, telling a local group of people who were supporting him exactly what was going on. And that video would blow your mind as to how he said, we're going to take over, people won't have the opportunity of, of deciding for themselves what to do, they won't have property rights. I mean, he, he goes right down the list and explains exactly what this whole plan is trying to do. We begin to see that, they said, that's enough of this, we're done. And they shut it out of their their counties and basically are home free at this particular point in time. But they're going this group is going to try to keep going and hammering and hammering, finding different ways of eroding local government to the point where they bring those seven counties back together again. Yes, Mike. That's one thing that we've we've learned. I've learned as a past county county commissioner is that they are relentless. They may not succeed this time but they'll wait until they've got a new commission or they've got a new group of people and they'll come right back and yes, incidentally will. to our uh, listeners please go to uh, look up on wikipedia or on the uh, on the internet the term the delphi technique yes that is a technique that these trained facilitators have been using to build consensus in communities, and then basically what they're doing is they're allowing uh, the local planning people and so forth to be sucked into this system where they are marginalized if they're against it and uh, made less uh, involved in the process, and they're given rewards if they do support the system. And it's uh, it's straight out of the Rand Corporation in the mid fifties. Mm-hmm. It's been used in our universities as a training tool to achieve consensus. And the original uh, founder of this technique was Dr. Pavlov in uh, Stalin's Russia back in the 1930s. So, with that said, um, uh, Michael, did you want to kind of uh, flesh out a little bit of how they're accomplishing the uh, program of the One Bay Area in the San Francisco Bay Area? Sure. Well, let me give a, a few details on what, what the One Plan Bay Area is. Um, in, in short, it takes about 5% of the Bay Area and calls it priority develop, development areas. This is where 80, 80% of the next 40 years' growth is to be p- placed. So, and what these priority development areas become are transit centers. So there will be it'll be housing without garages, but walkable to transit depots. They want to get everybody out of their car. That was mentioned earlier about Agenda 21, 
And so the way they're going to do it is to funnel $300 billion. I'll say that again, $300 billion to the infrastructure of the One Plan Bay Area. And the result of that will be the creation of these priority development areas and their transit centers where everybody is to live. These are the stacking packs. Single-family housing is there's just to be no more. Essentially, no more development of single-family housing in the Bay Area is the plan. And you say, well, what city is going to go along with that? Well, I can tell you every one of the 100 cities has gone along with it because they're all promised money for the implementation. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the listener's money. That's not California's money. That's the listener's money. I don't care where you live, you're contributing to the One Bay Area program. At the end of a program like One Bay Area, in every metropolitan area of the United States, there won't be any money left. Well, there isn't now. We're uh, $20 trillion in the hole right now. Well, they're playing on fumes, but they got big plans for the, for the exhaustion of those fumes. And um, in, the, in the rural areas, on the, on the San Francisco Peninsula, for people who know the area, you know, it's a very rural place with beautiful homes. They've picked these priority conservation areas, PCAs, where there's to be no human involvement. Now, these areas already have homes in them. If you're living in a place that's been designated as a priority conservation area, you know, it's not a situation we want to be an heir to such property because the heat is going to become very hot. So that's sort of the framework of the planned Bay Area. It includes things like, for people who understand know the Bay Area, there's a major artery, um, you know, regular road, it goes from San Jose to San Francisco. It's called the El Camino. And they want to change that to the Grand Boulevard and prohibit any privately owned cars, public transportation only. They want to redevelop that whole strip with high rises and work plants so you can walk to work or take public transportation to your job not far away. So it's the whole Agenda 21 idea of putting people into small locked cubicles and to make the wildlands or the or the open space um, the priority where people can't go. Yep. Sure. You know. It, well, it's, it's you know, and, and if I can interject right here, this is expensive stuff, folks. I mean, this is not cheap. You're, you're talking about a half billion, almost a half billion dollars, or no, half, no, a half trillion dollars. It's three hundred billion, billion dollars, half trillion, just in the San Francisco Bay Area, and Harvard Harvard uh, University did a study maybe ten to twelve years ago, where they looked at the cost of planning, and what they found, especially for San Francisco, already. I mean, it has. Uh, this was before all this stuff really started, uh, that the property values in prop in San Francisco had gone up six hundred percent, not because of intrinsic value of the land, but because of planning restrictions. Already it was happening back 10, 12 years ago before Harvard did this study. Another study back almost about the same length of time back in 2005, well, it's 10 years ago, 2005, they found that 30% of all your home sales across the country, which means some are higher and some are lower, basically is because of planning. It has nothing to do with the intrinsic value whatsoever. Now, some planning, of course, is necessary. You need utilities, you need roads, you need all these other things as well. But we're talking about social engineering here, and it's very, very expensive. And when you start talking about leveraging prices up to uh, five or six hundred percent of what it would normally be, that really has an impact on your community as far as its, its economic viability. And I can't say enough uh, how dangerous, I mean utterly dangerous, Agenda 21 is the um, the uh, whole program of sustainability and so forth. It's like these knuckleheads just lost their minds and just started to plan willy-nilly. And the tragic thing about it is that most of the things that they do don't work. Don't work. They're great on paper, but they don't work in actuality. So 
understand that we're, as Michael said, we're in a heap of trouble right now, and we've got to get this stopped. Well, you know, really what this boils down to, uh, our civilization under Agenda 21 will look very much like the movie The Hunger Games, yeah. where we, we'll have these mega cities, and everything will be a competition within those mega cities, and it'll be entertainment to uh, be able to pull people, the few people that are out in the rural areas, in and make them compete for food. I mean, this is just insane, but it, it that movie does a wonderful job, or those movies. Um, incidentally, I want to mention that uh, <clears throat> I've got a young man by the name of uh, Gerald Reed that uh, contacted me from... Uh, Miami-Dade County, and uh, Gerald happens to be a young black man, and he wrote me because of the concern he has about Agenda 21 uh, in the uh, uh, Brownsville section of Miami-Dade County. And I will just read a very quick quote uh, from him out of a letter that he wrote to me. It says, Agenda 21 does not care about the color of your skin or your religion. Its purpose is to snuff out the freedom of the middle class. This is uh, this is from a young black man from uh, Brownsville in uh, Miami-Dade County. This is happening everywhere, and he sent me a, uh, a HUD document that shows the Brownsville Transit Village and it talks about high-rise and maximum density housing. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Gerald's concern is is that they're going to lose their ethnic, uh, their neighborhoods, and they're going to lose them the same way that we are through a forced segregation, or integration, I should say, a forced integration that the local residents may or may not want because it may destroy the flavor of their local community so anyway uh, uh, Mike would you maybe talk a little bit more about that uh, with the uh, uh, Florida 750 plan how some of the local farmers and people are working with the uh, the urban areas to find out what they can do to work together well we actually haven't been working too much with the urban areas for some reason, once you get into an urban area, people are, are numb. Even those that are not involved, they're numb to this whole thing. They're just blind to it. And you can't work with them because they don't believe it. Uh, it's not until you get into the more rural areas that you begin to see how some of this stuff can really impact not only you, but everybody else in your region. And the key point, I think, is the fact, and Michael said it, these, tra these transit areas, uh, building all these high-rises around clusters and so forth around the station of a, of a high-speed railroad or something of that nature. That's what they were planning for this 750 program down in southeast Florida. And, of course, the people in, in the northern four counties could care less about that because it really does not have any impact on, on their lives and how they make their livings and so forth. But that's what they were planning on doing is, is gradually creeping in and building these high-rise buildings and moving people in uh, so that you have these population centers and then starving basically the the rural citizens off the land. I don't know how they plan to feed America, but uh, it is bizarre what they're trying to do. I mean, it is, it is so out in the left field that it's almost unbelievable that they can't see what they're doing. And maybe they can see what they're doing. Maybe this is deliberate. Uh, I don't know. I have no evidence that that is the case. But it's hard to believe that they can do the things that they're doing without understanding at least a little bit about the tragedy that they're starting to create. Well, don't you think, Michael, that the leaders know exactly what they're doing and the drones that are implementing it have no idea what they're doing? Yes, I, I do. I really do. I can't say that because I don't have any proof or any evidence of that. But at the same time, it's hard to deny uh, what is happening, and then not being able to see it. Now, my book, Plundered, that I wrote a couple of years ago, is still valid. It, it basically shows how people can be utterly deceived. I mean, it's just utterly deceived into believing things that just are not real. 
And that's what the progressive movement is doing in this country. And we have, as we're seeing in this current election, there's a lot of progressives out there that don't have a clue as to reality as to what's really go- what really matters and what doesn't matter and what can really harm you and what what is good for you. And it's just unfortunate because uh, this has come through our educational process. I'm getting off track here, and I'll stop in just a moment. But we've been taught socialism now for at least 50 years, and these people, you know, the younger generations coming up, good people, don't, don't get me wrong, but they don't have a clue as to what's going on, what our country was founded on, how why property rights are so important, why control of local government, keeping government small is so critically important. All these other things that you and I take for granted, they don't know. And as far as they, they're concerned, it sounds stupid to them. And so it's very easy to deceive them. And I have do I have some evidence and so forth of stuff back in the 1990s that suggested that the power players really knew this and they were going to take advantage of it, and they have. Well, and with that uh, said, guys, I have to tell you that uh, keep in mind they plan on reducing the population of the world yes. to under a billion people, and there's no better way to do that than to starve people. Yes. In fact, uh, the Global Biodiversity Assessment published by the United Nations actually implies that in its no, it draft copy. That. Yeah, Pardon? It, 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 it's not an implication. It states that uh, yes. if we remain industrial, we, we have to have a population of a, bil- of a, a billion Billions. or fewer. If we're peasants, we can have a population of four billion. So look to your future, if there is one, yep. uh, as a happy peasant somewhere. Yes. Doing the doing the deeds of the new world orders, uh, d- the d- dirty deeds of the new world order. Uh, Dan, b- before we're finished, I- I'd like to make mention of an organization called ICLEI. Oh, ICLEI yes, is the International do. Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. It's based in Bonn, Germany. And you won't go to many COGS and not find that ICLEI is involved in creating the COGS plan. They've, been, they've had a very important role with ABAG in creating the One Bay Area plan for the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, this is notwithstanding the fact that uh, many, many cities across the country has kicked Ickley out of their city. The city, the Ickley was working with a lot of city governments for globalization goals as well. And um, a whole rash of cities kicked them out. And what you find is that when the cities kick Ickley out, Ickley merely partners up with the COG mm-hmm. and proceeds. They have the mechanism for creating um, what a commentator in the Bay Area said was a city-state. In fact, the same commentator um, who spoke at the joint venture Silicon Valley conference, high, high-end high conference meeting um, with several thousand people, said that the Bay Area will become the first city-state from America to join the United Nations. Only Ickley says the future of the United Nations is the United League of Cities. The United Nations will change to a League of Cities, not of nations. And this first fellow, his name was Paul Sappho, said San Francisco Bay Area will become a city state in this United Nations program with little or no involvement with Sacramento and very little involvement with Washington. So this is the program, is to create these little these little outposts of world government and have them join up with the United Nations, not as, a, not, not as their country or as a country, but as a city-state. And I think Americans have to think long and hard about that. Mm-hmm. realize what that means. It's a complete abandonment of everything principled about America. The idea that your life is your life, not to be taken for a global objective. Mm-hmm. Your liberty is your liberty. You're to exercise your freedom in the way you choose. And your property is yours to use and enjoy. Agenda 21 is the antithesis of that. 
and these cogs spreading out and implementing Agenda 21 programs across the country is the bane of society. And unless we wake up, we're going to be swallowed by it. Yes, and remember, these are non-representative governments where you have no voice whatsoever as a citizen. Yeah, there's nothing I, I or Mike Kaufman or you, Dan, can do about the cog in your community because it's sanctioned by the federal government without any law, without any principle, sanctioned by the federal government and protected by the federal government. Well, we can do something, guys, and what we're doing is uh, things like this radio program right now. We need to awaken Americans to the knowledge that our country is being destroyed from within and without, and it's being balkanized just like so much of the world. We are literally losing our national identity, and we need to stand up and let people know, and programs like this one tonight are the way that we will accomplish that. Um, You've corrected me, and I stand corrected. Well said. (laughs) Well, gentlemen, I hate to do this, but we're uh, nearing the end of the program, and uh, I would like to have uh, an opportunity for you folks to, uh, Michael and Mike, to uh, let people know about your websites, about some of the things that you do, uh, some of the uh, books and so forth that you're producing. So uh, I will leave the next two minutes to you. I'm going to take the first minute, Michael. All right. Um, I would recommend that uh, listeners look at uh, the website Freedom Advocates. Um, you know, I think it's been a website designed for um, giving citizens real information about Agenda 21 and, and taking a philosophical perspective while evaluating that. There's a lot to learn there. Um, the site was badly hacked a couple of years ago. We've just about got it fixed up again, and uh, you'll find lots of information that will be of great assistance. Secondly, we have a, a site called Globalization of California, which deals with the COGS in California and has a, a conference. We held a day, day-long conference um, a year ago in the Bay Area um, describing the plan one Bay Area. Speakers like Pat Wood, Debbie Bacigalupi, Rosa Corey, myself, some local politicians who are opposed to one Bay Area. And uh, it's about a six-hour conference. And all on video, um, nominal cost, and uh, that can be very, very helpful to you. We also have a lawsuit filed against uh, um, ABAG, and the the study of that lawsuit is exposed in the same lawsuit. And uh, so I invite uh, I invite listeners to go to globalizationofcalifornia.com to get that information. Thank you. Mike, uh, can you talk about some of your, uh, yeah, your website we're, and some we're of your revamping, books? We're revamping our website called AmericaPlender.com, AmericaPlender.com. And in it we have, we're featuring two books primarily, uh, Plundered, which goes into the background of what we've been talking about here tonight, as well as some of the, the ins and outs of what's going on today and why we're having such trouble as well as a new book on uh, Islam. It's a small book. It's designed to read very quickly, bring you up to speed and so forth. We're currently writing another one right now. It'll probably be out in about six months. And uh, hopefully that will help people understand. Everything we talked about a year and a half ago when we wrote this book is happening right now. And uh, it was very predictive as far, well, it doesn't take much to predict what they're going to do. I guess I shouldn't be taking too much kudos for that. Uh, they're they're pretty pretty predictable, and we have a whole series of articles and other sundry things that you can probably really learn quite a bit from. So I would strongly suggest if you want to learn more about what we've been talking about, is to go to AmericaPlender.com and start looking at some of the op eds and and videos and so forth that we have. Okay, good. Uh, Kelby, with that said, uh, I'd like to thank our listeners for uh, tuning in to tonight's show, and please tune in next week. We will have a new uh, series of guests on, and uh, we will connect the dots. So, Kelby, turn it over to you. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Happel. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to conclude our call for this week. Uh, we appreciate you guys coming on these calls every week. We'll see you next Thursday, 6 p.m. Pacific. God bless. Good night. It was 1776 when the founders signed the writ of independence from the Brits. It was revolution. Now an enemy from within would enslave us all again and deprive us of our rights in the Constitution. <laughs>